chapter, verse by verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, we're in the 14th chapter of St. John. This is the place where Father said to, through the Son, in my house are many mansions. In heaven there are many mansions. And the word is mino, which means Moni, rather, which means a resting place. And to abide and dwell, the word plays all through the chapter. And it's the same Greek word. It means to be with us, and we will live with you. We will abide with you. They're not going to leave you. They're not going to forsake you. I feel one of the reasons Christ has emphasized this to this point is he's, he's about to leave them. He's about to be delivered up, crucified, but the whole promise was, I'm going to send you a comforter, and that comforter is available today called the Holy Spirit, and which is nothing but the Spirit of God and the Son, our God's Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. He loves his children. He's going to look out for them if they pray by his will and follow him. So let's pick it up, chapter 14, verse 30. Let's finish the chapter, Word of Wisdom from Her Father, and it reads, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. There's no way are we anywhere near alike. Um, verse 31, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and, and um, as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do, arise and let us go. Now, many people wonder, how, why is it that Christ is allowing himself to be crucified? There is a specific reason. It's very important, or you're never going to understand. Why did he have to die so we could have salvation? Because our Father created every soul there is, which is to say even Satan's. Satan is a child of God. And God must destroy him. So, inasmuch as Emmanuel, Christ being God with us, then it was Satan and his offspring that brought about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going, I'm going to read from chapter 2, the great book of Hebrews, verse 14, so that you know why Christ came in the flesh to die on the cross. And it reads, For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He didn't ask you to do something he wouldn't do himself. That through death, listen to me, that through the crucifixion, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. In other words, um, the devil brought about the crucifixion of Christ, ultimately. Who, who do you think it was in the crowd that said, crucify him? It was the offspring of the serpent himself. And certainly um, now God doesn't have to be abashed at saying, you're, you're going into the lake of fire. Because he started it, God will finish it. And the very first prophecy in God's word will come to pass and, to, and fulfillment through that. And I'm speaking of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, where God was talking to the serpent. He said, I will put enmity between thy seed, that's the serpent's seed, and the woman's seed, that would be Christ. You will bruise his heel, that he was nailed to the cross, but he's going to bust your head. And that's exactly what it comes to and then we'll be rid of it. Chapter 15, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Uh, it is a beautiful thing that God uses horticulture and agriculture to get a point across where you can really clearly understand it. What he's saying here, I'm the vine, and my Father is the pruner. He can whack, whack anytime he so chooses. Um, verse 2, 
every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. Uh, he prunes it and shapes it up that it may bring forth more fruit. He feeds it. Uh, verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. In other words, the very word of God, if you'll follow it, if you'll discipline yourself in it, it'll cleanse you. You got nothing to worry about. You don't, you don't need any pruning or purging when, when you're clean. And what does it? The word. And the word was with God. The word was God. Verse 4. And here's this money again. Abide in me. That's, that's you dwell in me. Find that rest in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you accept, uh, no more can you accept, you accept you uh, abide in me. In other words, you, why? He's the tree of life. Christ is the tree of life, and if you're not in him, you're not going to make it. Now, he has made this, let me ask you a question. If you have a vine and you go out and you cut a branch off of it, what happens to it? Just, just think a moment. What happens to a branch that you cut off? It dies. It withers. It's worthless. It's not good for anything. You have to stay in the vine to draw the sap and the nutrients that give you life. And with Christ being, spiritually speaking, the tree of life, then it is when you dwell in him and he dwells in you, abides then you have the, the nutrients and the word which cleanses, the word which strengthens, the word which gives you the knowledge and the wisdom if you seek it and study it, whereby you can withstand about any storm. Verse 5, I am the vine. There's the sacred name, I am that I am. Ye are the branches. He's making it real clear. He that abideth, he that dwells, he that is in that resting place in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. There's never a better piece of advice than that. You know, sometimes man, unfortunately, gets a little wisdom and kind of can try to go off on his own and forget where that wisdom came from. You can't, you cannot, as a no branch that's cut off, you can't live, you can't produce without being connected into the vine. You have to have a part of it to receive the nutrients, the wisdom, the knowledge, but probably most of all the blessings for uh, do you think that when you tie into the vine and you study and learn and that you have to do all that by yourself? No, he helps you. That's why he said, you're in me and I'm in you. We abide together. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So that's where our strength comes from, is uh, being a part of that vine. And... Um, who, he, and some bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. You've got to have him, or you will do nothing. Verse 6, if a man abide, if you're in that resting place, if a man abide not in me, you're outside of it, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. That's the way you cleanse, cleanse your vineyard. And, and uh, he's using this as an example. Naturally, this goes back to the tares as well, that they're at the end, the end of the millennium, if they have the choice, but if they still choose to be children of Satan, they're going in the fire. They're dead branches. A branch that has life in it can produce fruit. A dead branch can produce nothing but trash. So 
it's, there's not a, it's not a difficult choice to know where you would want to be. And, and thank God uses this heart of culture whereby you can see and understand. How many times have you brushed a plant accidentally and broke a branch off of it? What happens to it? You know, it dies. So you got to stay in the vine. You have to stay in the word. You got to stay with God. Verse 7 to continue. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now, naturally, a lot of people misunderstand this. The, the situation is to spread that word is to share it with others. Many people take this, well, I can pray for anything I want to, and he'll just give it to me. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about furthering the ministry, your ministry, your personal life, that um, you, you, um, you have to abide in him and stay in him. And if you need something to further your part of the ministry, whatever that might be. Maybe it's just help. Ask for it. Verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. This word, disciples, our word discipline comes from it. You'll be disciplined in the word of God, whereby when it comes to plowing, you can plow deep. When it's too rough for everybody else, maybe it's getting about right for us because you're into the vine. You're hooked well in. And he supplies you the discipline to uh, make even much fruit, even if the world may not like you all that much. Verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Do you, want me, do you want me to tell you a little secret? Do you know what this word continue is in the Greek language? It's meno. It's the same word as abide. It's if you abide, if you continue to abide, um, uh, you, will, you, uh, you are in my love. And that means blessings. You know, without God's blessings, I, I would hate to face this world today because it's getting pretty salty out there. But as long as you abide in him, you keep a tight grasp on the vine and enjoy what it brings you, then you don't have to worry about the world. The world, you are eternal. The world isn't. This world age isn't. The, the erets, the ter terra firma is eternal. We'll always have it. But this set time will end. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, th there's a big old if there. Listen to it carefully. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That's pretty simple, isn't it? And, and that's only fair. That if you try, you know, nobody's perfect. And we, not everyone has, or I should say most, ever, all of us, you're not going to have a clear, total understanding of all the word. Why? Because it's pregnant. It grows when God intends to release it. New information comes forth because the word tells everything. It's just that we have to know how to read it. But what he's saying is, if you abide in me, as I abide in the Father, then you will share that love and that understanding. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. You're, you should be joyful. Why? You glorify God when you love him. When you glorify God, you're going to draw blessings from him. And, um, and when, when you remain in that, it comes to its full, you will have joy. I know that there are many tears shed in this earth age. 
But you need not uh, stay there because you have this joy. The joy that this earth age will end and we will move into the eternity and those that do not reckon or align with the vine, there's a place for them and they're going to find it um, quite soon after the end of the millennium. Verse 12, this is my commandment. Now listen carefully. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. <clears throat> that means in the spirit when you abide in him, support each other. Those, those that are do, uh, striving to do God's work, encourage them. 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And of course, that's, that's what Christ would do. And do you understand what he's calling you here? A friend. N not a servant, not a slave. He's calling you a friend, a, a, a child of God. That he said, no, no greater love or, that a man can do than to allow himself to be crucified so that he could preach even to the saints all the way back to the time of Noah. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. Verse 14, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Now, did he just make a point-blank statement? Uh, you're my friends. No, that's not what he said. He said, you are my friends if. That's a big old word. If you do whatsoever I command you. Well, how do I know what he commands me? By the comforter and the word. They make a whole. They lead, they guide, they direct, and they bring peace of mind. Why? It's a resting place. In a troubled world today, if you go into that resting place of knowing that you're his friend and that when you follow his commandments, being a friend, he's going to stand by you. You know, if he laid his life down for you, do you think through the comforter he wouldn't help you today? That was what the whole purpose was about. Verse 15, henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Through the prophets, through, through uh, the Old Testament, the Word of God, uh, who do you think that spirit was that moved upon the waters and brought forth all things? And who was this that was with God from the beginning other than wisdom? Was the, Christ himself being the Father and he one and the same. How precious it is to have his unction, to have his hand touch you. You know, it makes life a lot more bearable. Because even when man maybe he gets confused and doesn't quite understand something, he just told you, I, I, I call you friends because somebody that's a servant, they don't know what's happening. But you're supposed to know how through the word. And if you're abiding in the vine, he will give you the unction of understanding whereby you can comprehend the scripture that he brings forth, because he just said, I've told you all things. You know what's going to happen. And the, what's important about that? When you know what's going to happen, let's just take one example. You know the false Messiah comes first, and you're not going to be deceived. How many people do you know, churches included, that know and teach the false Christ comes first, even though it is plain enough that a child can see it in the book of Revelation. He comes in the sixth trump. The true Christ doesn't come until the seventh, and there's no gathering back to him until that seventh, the farthers trump out. So he, he makes these things known whereby we're not deceived, and we can witness for him against the evil one, the one he paid the price so that in doing so, 
He can destroy death, which is to say the devil. He's sitting at the right hand of God until all of his enemies are made his footstool. Who do you think is going to, he's going to utilize to put them there? He's going to use God's election that are delivered up and the Holy Spirit, that same comforter, speaks through them and brings forth the uh, climax uh, of, of this very period of time. And you have a part in it. So I call you friend because you should know I gave you the word. Verse 16 to continue. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Now, a lot of people may not understand this, and that's, that's not good. You should. Because as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, he said, I chose you before the foundations of this earth, speaking to his election, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Now, this is, this, like I say, many might not understand that. Foreordained, ordained from before, as it's written in Romans chapter 8. He says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, concerning the saints, which means the set-aside ones, you don't even know what to pray for. Therefore, he will intercede in your life and, and cause things to come to pass in your life to bring you to the truth, the very word whereby you do bring forth fruit, whereby you do uh, and have the ability to ask anything in the Father's name, ask it in Christ's name of the Father. And certainly... Um, Father will give it to you if you're sincere and if you want to share that word, that truth. And many at this time might say, well, what am I supposed to do? Read Mark 13. God's election are going to stand against the very false one himself. You don't have much higher calling than that as a human being. And, and what a privilege to stand against Satan and allow the Comforter to speak through you as it's written in Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21 to bring about the consummation of this particular period of time. It's exciting the time we live in. Verse 17, these things I command you that you love one another. You support each other. Verse 18, if the world hates you, and it will, Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. And a lot of people will pray, you know, you'll hear them, Jesus is so gentle. I want to walk in his footsteps. Do you understand they crucified him? They beat him? They nailed him to a cross? And anytime you pray to walk in his footsteps and the world begins to come down on you like a ton of brick, then can you handle that? Naturally, you cannot, well, I, I just want to be a loving Christian. Well, that's good. But the world doesn't love Christians. And you're living in a generation that should begin to find it out. Because Christians are attacked, even in our own schools, they will further Islamic belief. But boy, you can't even mention the word Christian, a Christ man. That's in the United States of America. And here, what do we have to be proud of? Being a, Christ, a Christ man. Being a Christian. Let the world hang. We don't care about the world and their ways. If they want to go that way, more power to them. They they're better enjoy it. They're not going to last long. But you stay firm, abiding in him. And the world's not going to like you. You're not going to be all that popular. But that's fine, because you are with God. That's what's important. 19, if you were of the world, if you were a part of it, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. It hated our, our Savior, 
and uh, he saves us out of the world. Why? Well, this world is not really our home eternal. It, it will be, but there'll be some changes. This, these flesh bodies in this time period changes to a far better time. And that's, that's why it's well important and worth your time to abide in him, through him, and for him, praying for knowledge and understanding. And, and then maybe if the world criticizes you, oh, it just hurts my feelings. Don't let it. You know, if they want to go to hell, let them go. That's the, it's their choice. And you, you don't have to make any apologies for it. But you stay true to our Heavenly Father and receive his blessings. The world hated him and the ways of the world. Let's just say druggies and you, you go ahead and name a few others. Not all. You don't paint with too wide a brush because I suppose there are even druggies. I can remember in one case where a, a, a drug peddler told a druggie he needed to listen to this Shepherd's Chapel broadcast. So ultimately, God used the drug peddler to cause a druggie to listen to teaching, and he came clean. Okay, so you know God will use whomever He chooses. We don't, uh, we don't judge. We leave that in our Father's hands. Verse twenty. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. Once you teach someone the truth, nobody, Satan, nobody can pull somebody away from it. It's not for sale. Sorry, Charlie. But once one sees the real truth of God's word, there is nothing going to pull them away from it. They're going to stay with our Father. And so it is. But at the same time, uh, you know, I, I suppose everybody likes to be liked of man. But there's just some men, you don't care whether you're liked by them or not, because they are of the world. And, and all they do is bring trouble when it's much better to stay in the furrow, plowing deep, not looking back. 21. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. They're, they're lost. 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. They've got no excuse. I came, I worked miracles, I brought the word, and I don't care if you are a Kenite or who, those witnesses have witnessed well enough that you know it's a sin and there's no excuse for it when you turn away from me and go to the devil, the ways of the world. 23, he that hateth me hateth my father also. That, and, and that's true. What, what, that's a powerful statement. And, and I, I know it offends a lot of people in religions even in the world. But if you hate the Lord Jesus Christ, then you hate God also, the Father. And, and um, that leaves you in bad shape because you have no protection. You are out there for the devil to gnaw on and his evil spirits anytime he so chooses and, and making, making you hallucinate into thoughts and things because you're not founded in the Word of God to know truth from fiction, to know traditions of man from the real Word of God. So that's a strong statement. He that hateth me hate my father also. You're out. Okay. 24. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and... and um, hated both me and my father. They want to kill me. I, I raised a man from the dead, Lazarus. I fed multitudes. I, I healed the sick. To which of these do they want to take my life? Because they're of the devil, that's why. 
They are of the world. The world will hate. The ways of the world will hate the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they hate him, they hate the Father also, which means they're so far cut away, purged, clipped, away, dying bushes. So they're, um, the, uh, hopefully the millennium might wake some people up. Will it? Well, we'll find out, won't we? And let's go with the next verse, please, verse 25. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Now, Psalm 69, 4. I mean, it's, it's there for the reading. And, and so it is. They, 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 they had no reason. For which good deed do they hate him? For which good deed that he did did they lay a crown of thorns on his forehead? 26. But when the Comforter is come, that's the Holy Spirit, whom I will, listen to me, I will send unto you from the Father. Where does the Holy Spirit come from? The Father. Even the Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He'll, he'll make it known to you. That's the way he is, to complete the chapter 27. And ye also shall bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. You know, uh, when we take the fact that they were foreordained, from what beginning? How long were they with him? Then far from the beginning means a lot more to some than others. Because as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I stipulated earlier, I chose you before the foundations of this world. That means in the first earth age. You know what is really sad? God made it very clear in this word of God that there was an age before this one. That's why while they were still in the womb, Jacob, he loved, and Esau, he hated because of what they did in the first earth age. And, and this is why he would tell Jeremiah in chapter 1 of Jeremiah, I knew you before you entered your mother's womb. Why? He was with God. And while you were in your mother's womb, I ordained you a prophet. God uses whomever he chooses from the beginning. So many have election. Doesn't make you any better than anyone else, but it does give you duties and blessings from Almighty God. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. If you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. Father is the judge. You have spiritual discernment to know truth from fiction especially if God has called you, if he chose you, and for a reason, he can use you. And he, he, he knows that, and many of you know it as well. You've known since you were a child there was more to God's word than you'd been taught. And you've known it all your life. But that's the way our Father operates. Uh, 
Those of you that listen around by a short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. You've got a prayer request. You don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it out loud. Don't ever let anyone judge you of when you pray or don't pray. You can pray anytime you want to. And he hears you. Uh, so let's, don't ever let anyone take that away from you. That's your line of communication. That's talking to him and he to you. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you need guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. Joseph from Florida. If we are here today and gone by the time Satan comes, how is knowing about the Antichrist going to help us? Because truth always helps. You know, you, you must remember also, God is putting an army together in heaven right now. That army he's going to bring with him, along with God the election in the end times. And what a blessing it is uh, when he calls somebody home and they are lit and because of their knowledge they're enlisted in that army, ready to serve the living God. Uh, Ronnie from Ohio, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Do you have to go door to door to spread God's word? I don't drive, and please tell me how to share Father's word. Well, you know, uh, Ronnie, uh, the, in this generation, you want to read Mark chapter 13, where uh, God's elect are delivered up. They, they don't even premeditate what they'll say. The Holy Spirit speaks through them, and it's televised to the world against Satan. As a matter of fact, in Luke 21, it says even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say. So learning truth and being ready for that time appointed is extremely important. You keep studying that word, you're going to do just fine. Okay, Charlotte from New Mexico. Um, I'm anxious for a question. Is cremation acceptable to God? Absolutely. You can find that documented in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, that you have a most beautiful spiritual body that never ages. And when you, when the silver cord parts, meaning you die, instantly you go back to the Father from whence you came. And, and um, uh, what happens to this flesh? It goes back to dirt from which it came. In other words, everything your mother consumed was organic, and everything you have consumed is organic, meaning it came from the dirt, it's going back. So it doesn't matter how it gets there. You're through with it. You've got a perfect body waiting. Uh, Francis from Missouri. I love to watch and learn from your broadcast on TV. My issue is that when you answer questions, sometimes you respond in a way that it seems like you're making fun of there, the one who is asking intelligence in a condescending way. Where in the Bible does it state that you should respond in this way? There's a lot of people in the world that need you and your knowledge of the Bible in leading them on the right path. Not all of us has the same intelligence and understanding like that of a wise and gifted person. We, uh, those who have a harder time at learning and understanding, are offended by your response and will turn you off for an instant. Well, that's, you know, uh, tough love is a hard thing to understand. And um, discipline, a church without discipline is no church at all. And if I have to, if I have to be firm with someone, and I and, and I know they need it, it's my responsibility under God to try to help them, to draw them out of it. I know a lot of times you will hear me tell someone to grab their bootstraps, pull themselves up, and act like a man. You know, and and many people will say, "Well, boy, you have been," you know. Usually within two weeks, I'll get a letter from them thanking me, okay, for making them stop and think, to make something out of themselves. 
So uh, I, uh, I'm not going to apologize to you because I would never condescend to anyone. My main teaching is that you have to teach on three levels because there's new people listening all the time, tender ears. So you teach on a level that they can understand, but at the same time, you have to teach as Paul would teach, and you kind of uh, crack down just a little bit, but that's real love. That's not hardship or that's not making light of anyone. That's correction, discipline, and growth and maturity. And so it is. Um, I hope you understand. Uh, Heather from Michigan. Okay, thank you for bringing us closer to the Father. You are welcome. There is something I have always wondered about, and if anyone knows the answer, I am sure it will be you. Could you please tell me about the Bermuda Triangle, why strange things happen there, or if it is all just superstition? Uh, okay, Heather, you know, I want you to make a note of Luke chapter 13, because Christ is teaching there, and he said, hey, what do you think about the, the Galileans that were murdered out there? Were they more sinners than anyone else? And hey, while you're, well, about the 18 that the Tower of Siloam fell on, were they bigger sinners than anyone else? No, they just happened to be in the wrong place at the right time, okay, or vice versa. Uh, things happen, and superstitions can build from that, and... Um, that is kind of a, uh, I, I know there are many things that have brought this to pass. We have, uh, um, without judging anyone, we have, uh, for example, train air, aircraft uh, pilot training in that area or close to that area. And when you're training new pilots, sometimes they can get lost. And I'm speaking of one particular incident. The Bermuda Triangle didn't have anything to do with that. It was, it was just an accident. And with many others, so it happens that, uh, uh, but stuff happens. We live in a world that can, can things can happen. Uh, Kathleen from Michigan. Question for the telly. If one is truly one of the elect, as you said, you know some of them, and the only proof you said they might have is talking too much. The only problem they have is talking too much. So how does one know when the Holy Spirit chooses to speak through us when taken up before the end Christ? You're not to even premeditate about that, as it's written in Mark 13. What God wants you to know, he'll take over at that time. So if you're not to premeditate about it, that's why I say, if anything, I know people that would like to tell Satan exactly where to go. And they've got enough starts that they know how to do it. But we're to let the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, speak through us. And you're not to premeditate what you'll say beforehand. And he's got your name, your address, your telephone number, and he knows how to pull your chain. So you don't have to worry about a thing. Uh, Becky from Illinois, is there any way can, is there any way we can determine through the scriptures the length of time between the raiser of taxes and the vile one coming? Thank you. Other than it's a short time. Well, what is a short time? It's a short time with God. So it can be... A, a considerable period, but not all that long. It'll happen. Martin, M Melvin, Martin, rather, from Pennsylvania. Does the scripture indicate or suggest when the daily sacrifice will resume in order for it to be ended by the Antichrist in the midst of his uh, five-month reign? Thank you. Uh, it, it is a matter of he, he doesn't stop it from being taken. That's just say sacrificial love to Almighty God. But why does he stop it from going to God and the Savior? Because he wants it for himself. He stops it by people thinking he is Christ. And that's what shuts it down as far as 
a grace and glory from the majority going to God, Satan intends to take it for himself. That's why he is called uh, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. He will come in on the wings of desolation because he is the desolator. Okay, that's an entity, not a condition. A bill for Maine. Please explain First Chronicles chapter two, verse fifty-five, about the bloodlines. Well, uh, what 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 does it say? You know, just read it cal calmly. It it is giving Judah's lineage prior to the fifty-fifth verse. But in the fifty-fifth verse, it tells you who the scribes were for Judah. And it makes it very clear that they were from the house of Rechab, which is to say they were Kenites. And it is spelled out, K-E-N-I-T-E-S. And that word in the Hebrew, take your strongs and look at the word Kenites. It's the sons of Cain, the offspring of Cain. And uh, they were keeping books for Judah at that time. That's why they would, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, say, we claim to be the brother Judah, but they lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. Okay. <clears throat> Grace from Alabama. After Jesus comes to earth and the people on the right side of the gulf are with him, I am wondering what happens to the people on the wrong side of the gulf. Do they come back to earth also so they maybe preach too also? You know, we're not to judge, and um, anyone that didn't have an opportunity to hear the truth, God's fair. They're going to be taught through the millennium. So we, we cannot um, say that we know who's going to come back and be taught, other than to say it will be people that didn't have an opportunity. And <clears throat> quite frankly, you could have... 50 churches in a city. And if none of them is teaching the end time true gospel message, then a lot of those people haven't got a prayer. They're going to be deceived by the false Messiah because they're told he's coming to fly them away. And they think he's the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know that the Antichrist comes at the sixth trump claiming to be Jesus and the true Christ doesn't return till the seventh. They didn't have a prayer because of false teaching. Now, again, I'm not judging. I'm just stating facts. And, but uh, we, God knows who needs it and who doesn't, who deserves it and who doesn't. Cynthia from Vermont. <clears throat> when, when the Holy Spirit talks to us individually, can we be certain we understand completely and accurately Without, uh, without repeated confirmation. Well, you know, God deals in many strange ways. You mean in everyday life. <clears throat> Pretty soon, <clears throat> excuse me, you can plan to do something and feel it's exactly right. And after you do it about three times and fall flat on your face, it's about time to say, I got it, God. You want me to do this a little different way. <clears throat> so, that way, you know that the Spirit will lead you and you'll be fine. The, the uh, verse I just read, it's uh, something, I'm having trouble with your writing. Me, it said, <clears throat> I am resurrected and at the end of the world, I clearly stated Jesus was resurrected at, at the end of the world. Does it mean, he's, he's going to come at the seventh trump, okay? That's the easiest way, the way he teaches it in the book of Revelation. And it will clear a lot of things up for you. Uh, Latoya from Georgia. Can you give me, can you give to two different ministries and receive healing? The reason why I ask, because there have been different ministries that have sent me letters saying, if you will send $88, you will receive your healing. Sometimes I would send the money, but then they would ask for more. I don't mind giving, but I am on a fixed income and I can't give all the time. Thank you, Pastor Marie, for 
God doesn't send out beggars. If somebody begs you for $88 for a healing, they're frauds. Okay. And I'm not judging. That's just a fact from God's scripture. You're, you're letting them rip you off. Um, if you want a healing, um, then be healed. It doesn't cost anything. Christ paid the price on the cross. Do not let men deceive you. Um, and know for a fact, God does not send out beggars. And uh, so it is. So when, when you get those letters, refuse them. Send them back. Make, let them spend some money to get their letter back. Okay? You don't need to mess with the fraud. Uh, Connie, for, I'm just making points and winning friends here in the end times. Connie from Wyoming. But if, let's see, my question is about faith. Faith can move mountains. Okay, I wholly believe that God is able to move a mountain. But if it's not God's will for that mountain to be moved, my faith that he can, isn't going to move it, is it? Well, first of all, what, what does it mean when that mountain analogy is used? Mountains are nations. It means God can move a nation when he wants to. And 10 people stood up in um, Germany, Berlin, on church steps and prayed to God for leadership and to move that nation. And the wall come tumbling down because of Christians praying, 10 of them, that led to a, a certain thing. And so, yes, you ha don't confuse analogies with a literal mountain out there. If God wanted to even move that, he could with earthquakes or whatever, but he's not that destructive. Um, so there you go. Faith is a beautiful thing. Just hang in there and believe. Uh, okay, this would be uh, Frank from California. My question is on tithing. Is a person's tithe a lifetime balance, meaning... Do I owe for the years I didn't tithe regardless if I went to church or not? The answer is no. Why? The church didn't feed you. Uh, you tithe where you're fed. What? Fed what? The Word of God. Okay? So you weren't attending then. As a former Marine, I do not want to dishonor myself or God. You didn't salute Semper Fi. Um, this would be Linda from... My name is Linda from Florida, and I want to start by saying thank you for your teaching. You are so welcome. I enjoy them very much. The Bible states that it is a sin to live with someone outside of marriage. My husband and I divorced, but we decided to stay living together. My question is, are we now living in sin that we are divorced and living as married? I'm concerned about my salvation because the Bible states that we have to obey not only God's law, but men's law. Well, uh, you know, God places convictions on people. If, if, um, if he places a conviction on you that you feel you should, then you should reunite that or reaffirm even your vows. But as far as that's concerned, you both were dedicated to each other and you were both married and, uh, to, to each other. And um, so have, having that way, you almost have to follow your own. In other words, God has a way of placing um, uh, thoughts and, and leadership. So if, if you have that feeling, then maybe you should do something about it. Otherwise, um, you all enjoy your life. You're all right. Jean Ann, Jean Ann from Arizona. Who are the 24 elders spoken of in Revelation 20. I like to think that they are the 12 patriarchs and the 12 disciples. Uh, then would come the question, well, was Cain one of them? Well, that's, we're not to judge. Okay, we know that Cain was murdered. He didn't just hang himself. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 18. So we, we let God decide that, but I feel that that's who the 24 elders are. Uh, my opinion, Linda from Ohio, 
Is it true that God kept the spirits that chose Satan in the first world age to come to earth now in the end times, and that is why we have so much evil in the world today? It's fair. God always does things fair. If he's going to release Satan back on the earth, who would he most want to know who would follow him? What it was all about, the ones that followed him in the first earth age. That started in the generation of the fig tree, which was the year of our Lord, 1948. And anyone that has lived through those years has witnessed the decline in morals and our government and many other things. Um, so to, to that would back that up. Linda from California, today I was so shocked to hear you say Noah's flood was nothing to compare to the 40 days rain flood we will see in the time Satan will be here. Where is this in the Bible? Well, it, it, I think you are missing, mixing the Catabo with the Satan's flood of lies, Revelation chapter 12. You can read of it uh, in that very chapter. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying Father's Word, but most of all, God loves you for it. Makes his day. You make his day, he's going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his Word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. We're going to continue this discussion, as you see there, on wilderness. Now, you'll be lacking if you don't understand what the word wilderness means. Uh, in the Greek, basically it means in a lonesome uh, field place where basically uh, there are not that many people around. But in the Hebrew, uh, midbar is the word, and it's prime debar, which means um, a pasture or a field where animals feed. And also, 